Greetings friends. Welcome to Sovereign Grace Doctrine. I do thank you for taking time out of your busy day. I pray that uh, studies in the Word of God and studies in the history of faith be a blessing to those that are following along. Friends, we continue to be blessed the Lord to have more and more people watching us over YouTube and subscribing to us through or subscribing on YouTube and also following us on Facebook. And I'm delighted to say that uh, this is the first video we made that we can now say that we have hit, that we've passed the 100 mark on uh, YouTube and subscribers. And we're hoping here soon, if we haven't already, have up the uh, another uh, internet uh, video service, which we here will now in the next week or so be looking into and trying to get it set up to see exactly how that's going to work. But continue to pray that the Lord bless this ministry that we can send forth the gospel and the preaching and teaching of the Word of God to this lost and dying world. We do thank you for all those who are praying for us. Thank you for those that take the time to watch our videos. We pray that our studies would be a blessing to those that understand and believe the truth. We continue to study the book of 1 Corinthians here in chapter 12. Looking here as Paul speaks to that church at Corinth about them being the or a body of Christ or the body of Christ as it were. For each church is a body of Christ, a representation, as it were, of that true Christ, of the Lord. We are ambassadors for Him in this life, and we individually, we are not churches. But we must come together in groups of people to form a church. That is what church is. It is an assembly of believers, called out believers, that have come together to worship God in spirit and truth, and together to be the pillar and the ground of the truth where the truth is held up for all the world to see and displayed, declared even, and also where the truth grows in the hearts and minds of the believers as they are fed by the minister of God. Let us read here again. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and starting at verse 12 we read, it says, For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have made all and, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, Because I am the hand, because I am not the hand, I am not the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, am I not of the body? Is it therefore not of the body? Uh, if the whole body were an eye, were, were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, were, were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them in the body, as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of, him, of thee. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body, which seem to be more feeble, are necessary. And those members of the body, which we think to be less honorable, upon, though, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncommonly parts have more abundant and commonness. For our commonly parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to the part which lacked, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it, now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, second era prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles and gifts of healing, helps, government, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. <coughs> Friends, we 
see here the really it sums it up he is explaining in very accurate detail what a local visible ecclesia is a local visible called out assembly of believers who have been saved by the grace of god called out from their sinful walk of life unto service to a holy and righteous god to live for their lord and savior <coughs> to encourage and edify and build up one another, to strengthen together. Together we do that in the church. We strengthen one another. We help one another. We encourage one another. We cannot do that on our own. On our own, we are, have no one. We have no one to look to but the Lord. But that is not the way God has intended it to be. He does not want us to be lone heroes or lone uh, uh, on, our alone, on, on our own out there in this life, contending for the faith without some kind of support, some kind of place of comfort and uplifting and encouraging and strengthening to where we can be taught and encouraged in the Word of God. This is His body, His local visible church, the place where He'd have us to go to, the people He'd have us to be with, to come together and assemble together, my friends, as a body of Christ, a local embassy, as it were, a local people that are the ambassadors to all the regions round about you and beyond, to work together. We now have these things that we feel one for another. We hear now entering into 20, verse 26 where he begins and he says, And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. We suffer together. We feel it together. We love together. We, we rejoice because it goes on to say, Our one member be honored. All members rejoice with it. Being on your own is a great weakness. You're out there all alone in this world. No one to encourage you. No one to suffer with you. No one to rejoice with you when you're lifted up. Just you and the Lord and Satan. Yes, yeah, Satan's always there. Trying to beat you down and make you feel as though you're the only one left. But there are still churches in this world. There are still sound churches in this world to be members of. <clears throat> and we ought to seek them out. Not just any old religion. Not just any old group of people that say they're Christians or believe in this gospel. Many preach a false gospel. Many preach and teach things that are contrary to the word of God. Many are just a place to where there are men trying to lift you up and make you feel good about yourself. When we need to see our condition before a thrice holy God, that we are sinners, yes, sinners saved by the grace of God, and he would have us to come together to strengthen one another, to suffer together, to rejoice together, how do we suffer? How do we suffer? With those continued trials and tribulations which come upon us in this life, that when we see a member of our local church going through hard times, it may be sickness, the basic and simplest of things that we all have to contend with perhaps sometime throughout the year, and the changing of the seasons, the colds and other ailments, flus and viruses and COVID and all this that the world contends with now and whatever new virus will come up in the years ahead where they'll say, oh, this is the new COVID. It's time to quarantine again. It's time to isolate again. God would not have us to isolate. He'd have his people to come together and by faith trusting him, he will keep us from these things. Yes, there is that common sense that tells us if we're sick, stay home. And indeed, we should. If we know we're sick, we should stay home. But if we are fine, have no symptoms, then by all means, we ought to come together to worship our God, to lift up those that are suffering, those that would be under the influence of have the virus or some sickness or some ailment, those that are suffering, the members of the body that are suffering. Maybe it's worse than that. Maybe it's the news or they've got some uh, serious ailment. 
that requires surgery or operation. And they're, they're dealing with the fear, the understanding of this, that they're going to have to go under the knife of the surgeon. And even the simplest of surgeries, my friends, can be a life-threatening situation. You just don't know when the time is, when you're going to leave this life. And yes, we do and we know of those, that there have been those that have the simplest of surgeries. Just going to the dentist and things, something going awry and death entering in. But simplest to the worst, whatever degree it is of the surgeries and things which members of the body are facing. Maybe it's a family member that is not a church member, but still the members of that family are concerned and they've brought that petition before the body to lift up that loved one and pray for them. Certainly for salvation if they know not the Lord. Praying that God have mercy upon them and save them, that they might come to see the grace of God and believe upon the Lord while they still yet can. These type of things. Eventually death does enter in. Death does come. And there, perhaps there is a suffering which people do suffer. The loss of a loved one is an event which none of us looks forward to. But biblically, it's a time to rejoice. But do we really rejoice to see our mom, our dad, our children pass on before our time even? No. It is a suffering. We lament that, especially if we have no assurance of their salvation before God, that they've never professed faith, they've never shown signs of it. It's a time of sorrow. To believe that maybe one has gone on to, uh, to wait the judgment of God. But if there's hope there, if they live for a time, or even in the last days of their life, they seem to cry out and say, God have mercy upon me, a sinner. Save me, O Lord. If so, there's some hope certainly there. Not a lot of uh, witness to look back upon, but, least, but yet still there is a hope. There is that possibility before one dies that they can cry out unto God and receive the grace of God and be saved. But still yet those that have never shown any signs, that even to the very dying breath had no, no idea, no, no lamenting for their life. But died, yea, even in vain pride and arrogance, boasting of their wickedness and the way they lived their life. Oh, they did it their way. There's only a suffering and an understanding to know that they await the judgment of God. Because in this life is the only time you have the opportunity to repent and believe the gospel and turn to God. There is no place of purifying and suffering. This purgatory which many teach and believe is a lie. It doesn't exist. There's heaven above, there's this earth upon which we now dwell, and there's hell. Not the grave, but hell itself. A place of torment, a place of flame, to where those that die in their sins go to await the final judgment of God. And the day of judgment will come. But whether they be in that condition or even yet, yes, those that knew the Lord, we do suffer to see them go. We, we miss their company. <coughs> We're selfish that way. We miss, we, we hate to see the day come when mom or dad pass on. Or maybe it's grandparents or even others if you're fortunate enough to have the, those relatives still alive, great grandparents. Or if God forbid, it's the child. When it's our child. Regardless of their age, when a parent sees their child laying there before them dead, it's a great suffering. It's a great sadness. Whether they knew the Lord or not, certainly there's comfort if they knew the Lord, but if... Now, we would say this. There is the assurance set before us in the Word of God that there is in what is called an age of understanding. In truth, I'd say it's an age of accountability. Because once one is old enough, or before one is old enough, we might say, before a young child is old enough to communicate and to understand the speaking of words and to understand what sin is, before they're old enough to understand what sin is, how can they repent? How can they repent? At least they know what it is to be angry 
without a cause. How can they repent before they know what it is to lust for something and to covet for something? Oh yes, yeah, them children will fight over the toys. It's because they like that little play thing they've got. But they don't understand that yet. They don't understand uh, why is it that in them they want to have that possession that they can hold in their hands and play with, even though it may not be theirs. It's a friend's. Or some of the kids. They don't even know it play in the playground. It said nature of man is there. That nature is already there. <coughs> but still yet, where there is no law, there is no sin imputed. Where there is no understanding of that law and truth. For in God the law has always been. But God did not give the law in the garden. He gave one commandment in the garden. Do not eat of that tree. That's the only commandment they had. He didn't tell them not to run around like they were naturally. In a condition of nakedness. Because they didn't understand what nakedness was yet. They were righteous beings. Holy before God, no sin within them. But sin enter in after they eat of that tree, and it was and they. What did Adam say? He said, "I heard thy voice, and I was naked, and I hid myself." They then covered themselves, hid themselves, because they realized they were naked, and fear entered in. It's at the word of God where we realize transgression. Man does not necessarily on his own see it. But the word of God makes us see our transgression. And because we've sinned, we were, we're going to die. Because we were born in, with a sin nature, we're born in a condition of dying before God because of the sin nature within us. So yes, yeah, sooner or later we must all pass on. We must perish, my friends. And when again, when our loved ones go, it is not a comforting time, even though the Bible says to rejoice when one's left this sinful life. But we can only rejoice if we have a confidence within ourselves that that person has died in Christ, having trusted in Him, professed faith in Him, <coughs> shown forth, a, and we want to see a time period of desire. The desire that should come from the heart of a Christian, one who's born again, the desire to live rightly. Not for salvation, but because they have salvation, because they're born again, because they're saved. They, we want to now live for the Lord and be his faithful servant to do things according to what we understand by his word. No, we cannot yet, because we're still yet babes. We cannot yet keep the perfect word of God is set before us. But that's a part of our sanctification. We're being set more and more apart from this old sinful man that we were to the new man in Christ that we are. But sooner or later death comes. It's appointed unto us once to die, my friends. Death comes once. There is no cycle of life, death, life, death, life, death until you get to a state of perfection. As some wrongly believe there is no reincarnation. These people who believe that even believe the filthy animals that are running around at their feet, the rats and the mice. They believe even they could be their own loved ones that have been reborn in that condition or others. They do not understand the Word of God. They do not understand what it is to be made in the image of God. This, this is being made in the image of God to be a human being. Not the animals, the cows, the chickens, the rats, the eagles, the, any, anything out there other than man himself. Not even the angels. Not even the angels. The Bible says that they do not understand this thing of salvation. They don't understand why God gave his only begotten son, allowed him to go and suffer and die like he did. They desire to look into it. They desire to understand it, but they don't. It is not for them, my friends. Yes, there are some statements of faith out there that we will, that uh, can be found that say that there is salvation for angels that fail. But you'll not find that anywhere in the Word of God. Matter of fact, all you'll find is those that left their first estate, that they're bound in hell in, with chains, waiting the day of judgment. 
There is no redemptive work for angels who were not created in the image of God, but only for man who was made in the image of God, in the likeness of them, but yet we do suffer. To see our loved ones go, we, we suffer, especially with a good close friend, perhaps. But somebody we really didn't know, like the, the family member or friend of a church member that we might go to the funeral of, and we didn't personally know them, but we know the church member or the family friend, and we go to comfort and encourage them. We suffer with the members of the body. When a member of the church loses a loved one, or a member of the church passes on, we are saddened at their passing, but at the same time, if they knew the Lord and free pardon and forgiveness of sin, and we saw that, and by their example of life they're living, we have assurance of their salvation because of the way they were living. We're still yet suffering. We're still yet sad to see a faithful member of God go on to be with the Lord, but yet, that's where we desire to be, is it not? That's the goal, to leave this life, to be with our Lord and Savior, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But the closer they are to us, a good close friend. Oh my, you know, we have few friends in this life, don't we, my friends? We really do. Good close friends. But there is one friend that we know that sticketh closer than a brother, and that's our Lord and Savior Jesus. We look unto him in the final moments of life when death is approaching us and we can feel our life slipping away. We can look to him knowing he's waiting to receive us. He'll stand there. He's right there at the right hand of the throne of God sitting there. And when we come before him after death, he's going to stand to receive us as one of his chosen family members. We, yes, we are chosen of God and we are joint heirs with the Lord. We're his kinsmen. We're his brothers and sisters. We're his family. And he'll stand to receive us, my friends. I believe that by the word of God. We suffer. And when a member of a church is suffering, we are to suffer with them, my friends. Yes, we're to suffer with them. If we don't, then something's wrong with us. We ought to have that heart condition, that love one for another, to care one for another, to encourage one another, and that when someone is broken hearted because they have a child or a friend who is in a condition that they're about to die, or maybe they're already gone, and they're crying, they're lamenting, they're crying on the call because they don't know whether or not that person was saved, or to comfort them. Oh, no, don't go running to them saying, All things work to, uh, together for good to them that love God and are called of God. Don't go throwing that in people's faces at such a time. Yes, it's true. We all know that. It's true. That all things work together for our good. But when someone is in a condition of suffering because someone near and dear to them has left this life and they're not sure whether they were saved or not, that's not the time to begin to throw that kind of thing around. That's not what strengthens them. To remind them of the love of God and that He that they can look to Him, He'll strengthen them, give them hope and assurance. That if there was any way possible, if it was according to the will of God even, that they could have cried out unto Him and He would receive them. He'll not turn them out if they cried out unto Him. They sure even in the last moments of life, like the thief on the cross who said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. We're to suffer with our fellow members in Christ in the body, which is his local visible church. Let me say this again. The you where you're at may be going through something. You're suffering some traumatic event in your life, but I don't know you personally. You could send me a text message or send me a message through Facebook telling me about it, but still, I don't know your life. I don't know you. I don't know your circumstances. I don't know the honesty of it. I don't know the emotion of it. I'm not there to see you suffering. I'm not the one, some, me somewhere else, distant part of the world, uh, distant you know, distances away from you, not able to come unto you. I'm not the one who is there to suffer with you. 
It's the local members of the local church that you need to tell it to. Here not too long ago, my mother-in-law passed away. That was in our latest quarterly church report for 2024. Members of our church were at the funeral. They came to suffer with us. They came to encourage us. And not just there, but as in the days after that, they have encouraged us. They've said, we're praying for you. They and even others from other close churches nearby, people praying for us, telling them they're praying for us, and sent us cards of sympathy. Even sending food at the time of the funeral and the events of the day and when it happened and, and all that stuff. Doing what they could to be a help and encouragement unto us. Now, those that were of another church, they didn't have to do that, but it was a blessing also. And I believe that God blessed them for doing it. And every time you give aid of no another, God will bless. But the members of our church came and there were some that were able to come to the funeral. Some were not able to come, sadly. But that's okay, too. We cannot put such requirements on people. So, well, if you don't show up, I'm just going to look down on you. No, that's not the way to be either. But we suffer together, my friends. We suffer together. That's part of what being a member of a local visible church is about. That when you're in a condition of suffering, you have family members of God, your family members of God, that are in that close knit group, that local church, where God has brought you together with them and knit you together as a body in Christ, it's not universal, my friends. For there's great multitudes out there in the world that do not know you and cannot suffer with you and cannot comfort you in that time of need. Neither can you help them because you don't know them. But it's those of you that have come together in local, visible bodies of baptized believers that are parts, you're members of a church, a called out assembly of believers. You suffer together. When one is suffering, you ought to have the heart, desire, you ought to have the love in you to suffer with them, encourage them, to lift them up before God in prayer. Say, brother, sister, I'm praying for you. We're lifting you up. We're praying for you. We're praying God have mercy, give you strength, and help you through this present time. Friends, we're out of time again. We'll have to deal with the second half of that verse next week. But I do pray that God would bless and keep you all. Lord, help us all to stand, to be faithful in these days in which we're living. That we might be the examples, not just to one another in our local churches that we ought to be, but that we be the example of those visitors come, on, come and sit with us. That we be the examples to those that are our neighbors where we live. That we be the examples to those that go, where we shop and where we work. Everywhere we go. That all we say and do sets forth a Christ-like example before those round about us. That there is a distinct difference, my friends, in those churches of the Lord that have been brought together for the purpose of the gospel work to take the gospel to this lost and dying world and there is those out there in the world that have believed but yet have not been made a part of a local visible church. There is a difference. They ought to desire it. You ought to live and present yourself in a way that they want to be a part of your local body of Christ. Again, may God bless and keep you.